Should you spend your money on this book? Let's find out, and you can trust me to tell the truth because I didn't even sign an NDA for early access. I mean, they didn't offer it to me, but I would have turned them down. Before we get into any drama around the rollout of this new book, let's focus on the actual contents of it, the good and the bad. Okay, good stuff first. First of all, it's hard to ignore the actual size of this bad boy. It's about 70 pages longer than the old 2014 handbook, and for the most part, I think they utilize that extra space pretty well. The rules glossary in the back and the general organization of the book is a huge improvement too, and they open it up with a brief overview of the base rules that you actually need in order to start playing. Even the character sheet itself is more streamlined and easier to read with checks and saving throws organized under their corresponding abilities and nice big sections for filling out attacks, features, and proficiencies. Also, the modifier definitely goes in the big box. I knew it! As a beginner, before I started DMing, I always felt like the rules for 2014 were a nightmare to get through. Ultimately, I had to rely very heavily on my DM's understanding of the handbook because I just couldn't process it well enough for a long time. This was, funny enough, especially true when I'd try to make a character. I was constantly flipping back and forth between chapters trying to piece together the appropriate order for selecting character options like race, class, spells, backgrounds, and more. While there is still plenty of that involved, the book now intuitively starts you out with your class selection, which includes the class's spell list and a handy block of starting information that isn't hidden within a massive lore word salad anymore. Yes, they have done away with much of the flavor text in the book, which I personally prefer since I usually just make up my own stuff anyway, and I know that they use the extra space for other areas, but some people like the extra guidance on creating a backstory and personality, so this could just as easily be a bad thing for you. But I will say that this is made up for by the presence of some beautifully illustrated images to go along with each class, subclass, and many other character options in here. 99% of the art in this book is new, and the layout of the art seems really well thought out. The placement of each image works to serve the text by making it easier to read and digest in a way that inspires you with new ideas without an extra 10 paragraphs that many people will just ignore anyway. As for the mechanics of all these character options, most of the classes have received a large degree of improvements and quality of life changes. Most of them. Each class also has four subclasses to choose from, which is a great change of pace from most only having two or three in 2014 and the wizard having like 20. And everyone gets their subclasses at third level now. I actually kind of like this change, but I know a lot of people don't. I also like pineapple on pizza and I put ketchup on things I shouldn't. Fight me. To top it off, about half the subclasses are either entirely new or have been noticeably redesigned, and most of them are pretty great. Most of them. Overall, I'd say that the game balance in general has been compressed in a way that makes it so there are less must-have options and fewer useless ones. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. It's more like graduating from the kiddie pool to swimming with the adults. It's better, but there's still gonna be a little pee in there. The book is also designed to be backwards compatible with old character options, which I like, sort of. At the very least, you'll be able to use a bunch of the older subclass options, and you'll just take the subclass features at third level now if they came online at first or second before. We get some details on using older backgrounds and race options too, so you definitely won't be starved for choice, but I'll get into why I'm not 100% on board with this implementation a little later. For now, let's talk feats, because there are well over 70 of them in here, but that number can be a little misleading. 10 of those are origin feats that you'll now get as part of your background at first level. Another 10 of them are just the old fighting styles that have now been converted into special feats that you get when you gain the fighting style feature, and 12 more are epic boon feats that are only available at 19th level and beyond. 
Outside of those, you'll find that many of the available feats are the same ones you used from 2014 with some minor changes and one major change that makes this a good thing rather than a bad thing. Every single feat outside of the origin feats now comes with a plus one to one of your ability scores, encouraging you to take less ability score improvements for a more flavorful list of abilities and features. This includes the epic boon feats that honestly do a pretty nice job of expanding the bounds of high level play beyond level 20 for groups that like to RP as gods and fight a dozen Tarasks at one time. Although the rules for this epic tier of play are still a little loose and Tarasks still can't do anything to you if you have a fly speed. Haha! <laughs> Get fucked you big idiot! As for lower level play, 2024 introduces a weapon mastery system alongside new rules for equipping and stowing weapons that does a pretty nice job of giving martial classes more options for tactical combat than they had before. That aside, we got a lot of little quality of life improvements and restructuring on poorly worded features that aren't sneak attack. This includes the new heroic inspiration that allows you to re-roll any d20 test instead of just straight up advantage. The often misused surprise rules get replaced with disadvantage on initiative rolls, which does result in some kind of wonky changes to certain subclasses like the assassin, but I do like the change overall. The exhaustion mechanics also got simplified. It now just forces a penalty on any d20 test equal to two times your exhaustion level and reduces your speed by five feet for every level of exhaustion. When you hit exhaustion level six, you get to find out what your parents did to your pet goldfish. Why? Grapples and shoves are now triggered on unarmed strikes by foregoing damage and forcing the target to make a strength or dexterity saving throw instead of contested rolls. You can now officially fail a saving throw on purpose if you want to, presumably if an effect would somehow benefit you more than it harms you. Help is on the way! We get some extra conditions, like bloody, which happens whenever a creature has less than half their max hit points, and burning, which says they take 1d4 fire damage at the start of each of their turns. They also got rid of the garbage rule about not casting two leveled spells in a turn, or whatever. Yes, I know that wasn't the actual rule. It was confusing and dumb, and now it doesn't matter. Instead, you can now cast only one leveled spell per turn that uses a spell slot. Oh, and healing potions are a bonus action to drink now, but you were probably already doing that. By far, the best part of this is that the new rules are going straight into Creative Commons, along with the DMG and Monster Manual when it's released in February. So if you can wait that long, you could just forego picking up the book at all. Thanks, WotC. That's totally just good news without any drawbacks or any need to elaborate at all, right? Right? Ranger. Truly most of what I take issue with is what the designers didn't do rather than what they changed because a lot of this is a reprint. Also Druid. Your starting ability score boosts are now tied to backgrounds along with an origin feed, which makes a lot of sense on the surface. I like the approach of removing these boosts from races in an effort to make the game more flexible. But the backgrounds that they give feel needlessly restrictive since they only offer your choice of three boosts tied to an origin feat and a couple of proficiencies. For my first game in the new rules, I made a paladin, which you can check out here, by the way. And I decided that I wanted plus one boosts to my strength, wisdom, and charisma as the best fit for my character's personality and mechanics. Wouldn't you know it, that combination doesn't exist at all in the backgrounds available. That didn't feel good. It seemed like I was being forced down one of 16 set paths rather than being able to chart my own course. Now, for what it's worth, the rules do state that we can ignore the narrative flavor for the chosen background, choose an older background, or work with our DM to create a custom one, but it's hidden in a bunch of other text that could be easily missed by anyone flipping through for the first time. My hope is that the DMG will offer more guidance on creating custom backgrounds for players, or at least offer it as a clearer option. On that note, Bond's ideals and flaws have also been done away with. This isn't something I'll miss personally, but I know a lot of people found it useful in creating consistency in their character's roleplay and decision making. But what really baffles me is that this was cut when alignment is still here. That makes me chaotic bothered. Passive checks also still exist, but they've been buried deep within the rules glossary, which I feel like is the worst possible decision versus either making passive checks more important or just getting rid of them entirely. 
I'll let you guess which one I would have preferred. There are now 10 species to choose from that have all been rebalanced and reworked somewhat, but there are no mixed species. The apparent intention here is to allow you to mix any species by drawing on the rules for one of the two parents, rather than an actual lineage system like you have in other TTRPGs that let you mix and match. This isn't a huge deal breaker for me, but it certainly feels like a big missed opportunity to expand the possibilities of the system rather than just giving us a slightly tweaked version of what we already had. And don't even get me started on the new crafting rules. What crafting rules? Exactly. This cute illustration of dwarves baking cookies is more of a crafting system than what they actually gave us. There's less than a page on crafting items, potions, and scrolls, yet WotC managed to put out an entire five minute video boasting about their new system without actually saying anything about it. Now I can see why. Once again, my fingers are crossed that we get something more robust in the new DMG, but if you're tired of waiting, there are some pretty great third party systems out there that you can adapt into your games today. There are also something like 400 spells listed out in the book, with only a small fraction of those actually being new spells. Some rebalancing has come through, and I do think it's better, but there are also several options that absolutely break the game and should not have made it through the playtest. Conjure Minor Elementals in particular is absolutely cracked, and it doesn't even require a bad faith interpretation of the rules to get it there. Oh well, at least True Strike is more than just a meme now. The overall experience of D&D will be largely what you're used to, and that's not really a bad thing. But I do feel like the popularity of Base 5e made the designers a little too timid about changing too much of what worked in the most popular rule set of D&D to date. A lot of new features are just official adoptions of optional rules from books like Tasha's and popular homebrew rules that people were already using. And sure, there's benefit to having all of the information in one book, but it's hard not to imagine what a true departure from 5e might have looked like for those who wanted it. Taking this book for what it is, there's good value here for just $50, given how big it is and considering that some of their recent smaller books actually cost more like $60. Does that mean you need it? Absolutely not. And I think WotC knows that. Hang on. There we go, that's better. It is a fact that WotC and D&D Beyond tried to remove the ability to use the 2014 spells and magic items for your characters on their service when they could have just as easily made an on-off toggle during character creation like they've done in the past. They proposed that players would need to input the old rules as homebrew for their characters if they wanted to use the old spells, which sounds like a massive headache to me. In their defense, WotC walked this change back pretty quickly, and I applaud them for doing so. Was this an attempt to force players to buy the new book? I really don't know. I'm at least happy that they seem to be responding better to criticism from fans. What I do know is that you do not need this book in order to play D&D. You don't even need it to play with the new rules. After all, this is not a new edition. That much, everyone can agree on. With all that in mind, I do think the book provides enough value to be worth the $50 price tag or the $30 one if you get digital only, especially if you're just getting into the hobby now and you don't already have the old player's handbook. I'm actually already playing with the new rules in our games and I'm enjoying it just fine, but you can probably also get a pretty good handle on using what this book contains by just watching the countless videos of new features and rules like either of these ones. Now, until next time, go out there and make some chaos.